Gresham College presents A New Theory of Economic Growth by Douglas McWilliams, Gresham Professor of Commerce. Tonight we have what's going to be the most technical of the lectures this year. So if you want to walk out, the door is still open. Um, though my objective is to keep the level such that an intelligent layman uh, can keep pace with the argument. The first task is to present a new theory of economic growth. And my colleagues here, uh, Charles Davis and Oliver Hogan, are going to help with anything that's complicated. I'll start by explaining the historical context and then move on to explaining the traditional theory of growth. Then Charles will show the forecasting context which explains why we need a new approach to economic growth. And then Ollie will explain the theory of bounds of payments constrained growth and how by adding an inflation constraint, the theory changes and what that means. And finally, I'll come back with the policy implications of all of this. When I was a young economist at the Confederation of British Industry, I was in effect apprenticed to the then CBI chief economic advisor, um, Sir Donald MacDougall. And he taught me much of what I know about practical economics. Donald was a very good economist who had been involved in major events. Uh, probably the most important of these was what he did for Lord Charwell during the war in the statistical unit in Churchill's bunker. This had a considerable influence on the Battle of the Atlantic. And indeed, if he hadn't got his sums right, then you'd be listening to this lecture in German. Or possibly not at all, because I think I have a slight tendency to say what I think. I doubt if someone like that would have got very far under the Nazis. Donald served again as Churchill's economic advisor after the war, and in the late 60s and early 1970s, before being promoted to join the Confederation of British Industry as their chief economic advisor. And I had the good fortune to succeed him as chief economic advisor at CBI and to speak at his memorial service at Nuffield College, Oxford. Donald was always very conscious of the balance of payments constraint on, as an issue affecting economic growth and wrote many of his books on the subject, including what's probably his major work, uh, The World Dollar Problem. And since growth that's demand constrained is our theme, I'm dedicating this lecture to his memory. Donald's memoir, Don and Mandarin, tells of his excitement when he visited Cambridge uh, to hear an early pre-publication virtue of Keynes's general theory when he was a postgraduate student at Oxford in the 1930s. Keynes's thinking is an important part of this lecture. Keynes died prematurely in 1946, probably worn out by his huge efforts during the war and his post-war reconstruction work. And I never had a chance to meet him, but I feel slightly through Donald McDougall that in some way I have a link with him. And I keep a copy of his book, as you can see, close to me. I've always been happy to call myself a Keynesian, even when it was unfashionable. And though I think Keynes was a much more considered man than many of his followers, and he remains with Adam Smith and Karl Marx, my three economics heroes. Keynes was a man of many parts. He was married to a ballerina from Diaghilev's company. He invented what was called the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, which became the Arts Council. So he wasn't just an economist. He was a much broader individual than that. My other link with Keynes was that uh, a rector of Lincoln College, Oxford, my alma mater, was Lord Trend. And Lord Trend had worked as private secretary to the Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1946. And he told me that Keynes, who at that period was effectively co-chancellor, negotiating the American loan to tide Britain over after the war, and therefore he worked in the Treasury, uh, Keynes had introduced him, Lord Trend, uh, to opera. And one winter evening had gone to the lengths of walking all the way across from the Treasury in Great George Street to Covent Garden, to the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden, and back, 
to get him tickets for an opera that he particularly wanted uh, Lord Trent to see. Even to today, this would be quite a strenuous undertaking for a prematurely aging man. And in 1946, through the London smog of the pre-Clean Air Act era, uh, it would have been much more so for a man within a few months of his death. I think this says quite a lot about the sort of man that Keynes was. And I know that Burke Trend remained impressed for the rest of his life by the memory of this really great man and what he had done to go out of his way to help someone who was, in effect, a pretty obscure young civil servant. I've been helped a lot in my career by two other economists who are here this evening. Dermot Glynn, who was my first boss at the CBI, and who sweated some blood both to make me a better economist and also to cope with my exorbitant pay demands in the inflationary 1970s. And to Samuel Britton, who is the journalist fellow at Nuffield College when I was doing my MPhil at Oxford, and who helped me turn from speaking mathematics to something resembling English through countless late evening discussions. He also opened my eyes to many parts of modern free market economic theory that had been overlooked by my tutors, possibly inadvertently. So Samuel also played the part of Keynes with Bert Trent by introducing me to opera. And one of my fondest memories is taking me and my Louis affianced wife to be, I answer, to Glyndebourne to see Sir Peter Hall's production of Fidelia, which remains my favorite opera. Donald McDougall was immensely helpful to uh, us junior economists uh, who were trying to make their way in the world. And he showed what, in retrospect, looks like extraordinary patience with us. I think it's taken me to the age of 60 to realize quite how patient uh, he, he was. He's been a very good example to me, and it's one I try and pass on to the next generation of colonists with whom I work. And so this evening, I've invited Charles and Ollie, both of whom work as managing economists here, with whom I've developed much of the thinking that's embodied in this lecture, uh, to come with me to cover parts of the talk. My first two lectures have provided the raw material for this one. They've developed three concepts. First, the super competitiveness of the emerging economies. Second, the continuing shift in terms of trade in favor of primary products and away from finished goods and services. And third, the likelihood that overall world economic growth will be constrained because of the limits because of the shortages of natural resources meaning that some of the enhanced economic growth in the emerging economies will be at the expense of lower growth in the mature economies. The first lecture two months ago concluded that the second great transformation, the industrialization of two-thirds of the world's population, was indeed the greatest ever world economic change. The scale of the shift was remarkable, but even more so, the speed. Essentially, China is achieving in 50 years what it took us in the West 150 years to achieve. One of the consequences of this has been that attitudes in the emerging Eastern economies have adjusted much more slowly than they might have had the pace of economic transformation been slower. And so there's a discontinuity between economic behavior, where their attitudes are rooted in their traditions, and economic performance, which is very much rooted in the present. And one of the consequences of that discontinuity is that the emerging economies have become super competitive because they've not allowed their emerging prosperity to blunt their economic edge. Now, in the second lecture, we had the benefits of Thasmoaitis from Extrato, who helped us on the mineral side, and my brother, Michael, who is a, an energy expert. And we concluded two things. First, it was likely that the terms of trade between um, finished goods and services on the one hand and primary products on the other were likely to continue to move in favor of primary products for at least a uh, disequilibrium period of possibly about 50 years or so, even though ultimately the law of the elastic supply is likely to come in eventually. But that would cause their price, in the interim period, their prices would rise in real terms. And that, in turn, would create limits on the total pace of economic growth in the world, uh, because at times when growth was becoming rapid, we would see a spike in inflation caused by rises in primary product prices that would then act as a constraint on overall growth. 
Tonight, we turn to the next step in the argument. If the future growth in the world economy is to have these three important characteristics, what determines the growth prospects for the mature economies? Our new theory, of course, is only partially a new theory. Even in economics, there are never anything, there's never anything that's completely new. What it does is it builds on an old theory by developing it further to take account of the changing economic circumstances. One of the distinguished economists to whom I showed an early draft of this lecture said that if a theory was true, it must be true for all time. Theories cannot come and go like fashions in clothes. I think this would be a very fair point to apply to a scientific theory of how the world works, which is meant to be a complete and true explanation. But economics is just a way of describing how people behave in one particular sphere. And economic theories are essentially simplified models of the real world. And the relevance of the excluded variables changes over time, just as the way in which people behave changes over time. For example, when I was young, most young boys wanted eventually to own a fancy car. Now they want fancy digital devices. Two things change, people's behavior and the economic factors affecting that behavior. So whereas scientific theories should be true for all time, economic theories can be more or less applicable depending on the circumstances. The current mainstream economic growth theory that's embodied, for example, in the forecasting model used by the Treasury and OBR, the OBR now and the uh, Bank of England, um, distinguishes itself from what is so-called, often called business cycle analysis by focusing on the determinants of long-term rates of growth in economic activity. Built into this, theory is the concept that over the business cycle, the economy generally returns to a mean. In fact, most of them assume that economic activity returns to where it would have been. And underutilization of resources largely disappears. And this is what generates what we call mean reversion that seems to be built into Treasury, OBR, and Bank of England forecasts. The three characteristics of this modern growth theory are, one, growth in the medium to long term is determined by the availability of resources of labor and capital, which are exogenously determined, and the productivity with which they're used. Inflation is determined with respect to an inflation augmented wage equation, where wages, or more precisely the rate of change of wages, are determined by labor market conditions and expected inflation. And this is sometimes called the expectations augmented Phillips curve, the Phillips curve being a crude representation of the short term relationship between inflation and unemployment. And the labor market conditions which make inflation non-accelerating is called the NIRU, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. How far you have to keep unemployment to stop inflation accelerating. Now, for the technically minded, for those who are familiar with the papers, this is the solo swan model with the Friedman and Phelps edition of the inflationary conditions in the labor market. One of the implications of this theory is that if there are underutilized resources, they will bring inflation back down if it's been excessive, and which in turn, either through the monetarist route of creating excess real money balances, or through the Keynesian route of permitting additional policy expansion, causes the economy to grow again. Because the economy is considered automatically to right itself, you can look at growth in the long term as determined by the supply side, the factors of production. Part of the credibility of this approach is that it seemed to describe well what happened in the UK in the 1980s, when many traditional economists had argued that the economy would continue to be depressed after the severe counterinflationary squeeze that had been imposed after Mrs. Thatcher had become Prime Minister. Indeed, the gang of 364 academic economists, they wrote to the Times in a letter originally dated Friday the 13th of March 1981. I think it's not entirely coincidence that it was Friday the 13th when they wrote it. Mm -hmm. After the 1981 budget, claiming that A, 
There is no basis in economic theory or supporting evidence for the government's belief that by deflating demand they will bring inflation permanently under control and thereby induce an automatic recovery in output and employment. B, present politics will deepen the depression, erode the industrial base of our economy and threaten its social and political stability. C, there are alternative policies. And D, the time has come to reject monetarist policies and consider urgently which alternative offers the best hope of sustained recovery. Unfortunately, what the gang of 364 forecast turned out to be largely wrong. The economy not only did recover of its own accord, but did so pretty well the day that the letter got published. And that didn't do very much for the reputation of either Keynesians or academic economists. Now, I think you have to say in favor of the people who wrote this letter that actually uh, fiscal and monetary policies were relaxed surreptitiously with both interest rates being cut and the budget deficit being allowed to rise somewhat compared to what had been planned in the 1981 budget. A sort of plan A plus, I suppose. Uh, though that got disguised by fairly aggressive rhetoric from Mrs. Thatcher and the then Chancellor Sir Geoffrey Howe. And I think although the gang of 364 got their forecast wrong, they were probably right that there was damage done to the supply side of the British economy by the squeeze although I still think it would have been difficult to get inflation down by any other route. The episode did much to undermine the reputation of academic economists and Keynesianism, although in my view, Keynes would not have signed so stark a letter. Donald McDougall, then aged 91, told me over lunch a few days before he died that he most certainly would have done so had he not thought it politically inappropriate for a CBI chief economic advisor to get so involved in such a partisan manner. Through the 1980s and for some of the 1990s, the Treasury economists, initially under the then Terry Burns, now Lord Burns, had a remarkable track record in accurately forecasting the economy that contradicted the dismal expectations of the so-called Keynesians in academia. But in the present century, official forecasts have got worse. First, the financial forecast for government borrowing started to become seriously over-optimistic. And then after the financial crisis, the GDP forecast also became over-optimistic. And even hiving off the Treasury forecast is in 2010 to provide a new independent body called the Office for Budget Responsibility, or OBR, has failed to improve the performance. In fact, it's uh, further deteriorated. The stimulus for this lecture came from what was, in effect, a challenge from the current head of the OBR, Robert Choate, I asked him at last year's post-autumn statement press conference, about a year ago, why his forecast still incorporated mean reversion, the assumption that growth would return to normal automatically, despite the emerging evidence that this would not happen. And he said he was bound to do so because of the statutory requirement on him to produce cyclically adjusted estimates of the budget's deficit. Now, I took that to be a sort of sophisticated version of the old joke that what economists do is they prove that what works in practice doesn't work in theory. Now, I'm not sure that Robert intended this as such when he said this, but I took this as a challenge. If the theory doesn't work, go get a new one that does. So now I'm going to hand over to Charles, who will talk about the track record. Charles. <coughs> Thank you, Doug, and good evening. Yeah, so essentially, my aim is to, to run through the evidence in a quick interlude um, that, and assess how the Treasury's been doing on its track record uh, and offer a view on how others have been doing. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the other forecasts out, of the, out there. Unsurprisingly, I'm going to focus on, on CBR's record, um, Douglas, of the organisation of which Douglas is, of course, chief executive. So, now, our view is that we need a new theory of economic growth because our existing understanding, the traditional economic growth theory, has let us down. And that, of course, then leads to repeated mistakes uh, in official economic projections, which has wider implications in terms of the overall uh, policy formulation. Uh, last year, CityWire uh, claimed that the OECD and CBR uh, can be deemed to be consistently among the most accurate forecasts for the UK economy. And at the same time, we had David Smith and a rate from the Sunday Times and a range of other commentators uh, describing uh, CBR as having been the closest to getting our forecast right. This year, 
uh, we hope to be not top of the class, uh, barring in a very unusual uh, outcome in the, in the final quarter of this year and the economy, but we're probably going to be in around the top three or four. So um, we've had a reasonable track record of late, um, as far as one can be uh, when it comes to economic forecasting. Uh, you only have to look at how we do on a, on a quarterly basis to see how difficult it is to get our economic forecast exactly right. But really what I want to do is assess things from an independent viewpoint uh, as to how the official forecasts have been doing. Uh, this graph shows quite neatly just uh, how recently uh, short-term forecasts have deteriorated in quality, really. Uh, the blue line is the forecast that was made a year prior to the year that we're looking at, whilst the red line uh, shows the actual outturn uh, according to the latest vintage of Office for National Statistics data. And so whenever there's a gap between that blue line and the red line, that's when you know that uh, we've been getting, the Treasury has been getting things wrong. Uh, and you can see that lately we've had a prolonged period where the, uh, the, the, OB, the tre Treasury and then followed by the OBR have been significantly over-optimistic. This graph just analyzes the forecast error, so simply the forecast less the actual outturn. And you can see that uh, in recent years, we've had five, five successive years of overestimation. Uh, and we've had uh, not only one year in which there's been uh, a forecast that was in what you'd maybe think of as a normal margin of forecasting error, probably around 1%. So you've had the sustained period of over-optimism from Treasury and OBR uh, economists. When you look over a slightly longer term, uh, it, the picture is shown even more starkly. Uh, I've chosen four-year forecasts in which to compare Treasury uh, CBR forecasts with the actual outturn, uh, and that four-year is fairly arbitrary, and it's just that how I could get the data to, to fit given the constraints on data availability out there. But all of this data is in the public dom domain from, from Treasury and, uh, and uh, obviously official data. Again, you can see that the forecasts have been consistently too bullish. Um, the difference between uh, the green average actual growth and the blue bars, which represent the Treasury forecasts, are quite stark. Uh, if you look at the first bar, we've got the uh, forecast made in 2007 from two, for 2008 to 2011. And OK, uh, we were significantly over-optimistic then, pre-financial crisis too. But you can see that the Treasury's optimism has, has not waned in the years after that. So something must be going wrong. Uh, indeed, those 2007 forecasts are out by a colossal 14% uh, when you look at it over time. Uh, and even in 2008, when things had started, when we thought things, we started to get a good feel for what was going wrong, the Treasury still was out by 9% over a four-year period. And of course, it's this four-year forecast which is most affected by the assumption of mean reversion, which Douglas referred to earlier. And of course, this central forecast plays a pivotal role in setting overall, the overall thrust of macroeconomic policy. But it isn't just the Treasury who've been getting their forecasts wrong. This slide shows that the Bank of England has made similar errors uh, and indeed has just revised down their forecasts once more. They've not yet published the latest data on, on point estimates of, of probabilities of their GDP forecasts. But if they did, the, the dark blue line, which is the, the August forecast, the latest forecast would be even lower still, uh, as you'll have seen in all the headlines in the papers today. Now, recently, both the bank and the OBR have had investigations into their own forecasting track record. The bank commissioned David Stockton, former chief economist from the Federal Reserve, to look at its forecasting record. It's a very serious report, which uh, makes good suggestions and is worth a read. Uh, and in particular, he picks up uh, a key problem with a, with a forecasting methodology. He comments, some of the inertia exhibited by forecasts simply reflects the slowness with which forecasters spot deeper structural problems with the stories underlying their forecasts. In the MPC's forecasting process, there are few mechanisms capable of acting as a trigger for a fundamental reassessment of the outlook. Some of the options presented in this review are intended to create more speed bumps in the forecast process that might disrupt its initial, uh, sorry, its natural inertia. For example, the possible development of a staff forecast and even greater engagement with external forecasters and scholars. The OBR for report on forcing errors is by its nature a more, much slighter piece of work. Uh, it's essentially based on economic accounting and shows where the errors were made, but not 
considering why. So both reports really fail in that they, they do not get to the roots of the theoretical problems that have caused the forecasting failures, which I hope you can see uh, from the data I presented. I'll hand back to Douglas. Thank you, Charles. Now, I think that there are two reasons, essentially, why the official forecasts have been so bad. The first is that they failed to understand the long-run implications of the financial crisis. Um, the sort of classic work on this is the book by uh, 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 Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff. Um, this time it's different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly, which I'm sure all of you have read. Um, and uh, that shows very clearly that recovery from financial crises tend to take a lot longer than recovery from other crises. It typically could take a decade or so. Now, this only very weakly permeated the minds of the official forecasters initially. I think they've more or less woken up to it now, but you know we're five years down the road, and that's five of those 10 years before they've suddenly got, got used to it. But I think the second reason is even more fundamental, and has affected particularly the medium-term forecast from the Treasury and the OBR, which is that the official forecasters have been working on a theory of economic growth, which is essentially supply constraint. And I believe that the factors that we had identified before, which have changed since the 80s and 90s, um, when the official forecasters did get their forecast right, mean that for the foreseeable future, growth in Western economies will be constrained by both supply and demand factors, and a demand-constrained theory is needed both for forecasting and economic policy formulation. So let me turn now to the theory that we want to put forward. And Oliver, who has done some work on this uh, for some of our projects, is going to describe it. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you, Douglas. Um, so the, the prof, as we like to call him sometimes, especially when he's in a bad mood, um, has been telling us about the key changes that have, have affected the world economy. Um, and other than the aftermath of the financial crisis, these are first the su super competitiveness of the emerging economies, uh, the change in the terms of trade in favour of primary products, and the fact that world growth is constrained by <clears throat> uh, the inflationary consequences of primary product prices uh, when the world economy puts its foot on the accelerator pedal. Um, these particularly impact through the balance of payments, which is why our new theory is not really a new theory, but the development of an old theory. Now, the static balance of payments constrained growth model was developed by uh, Sir Roy Harrod in the 1930s. And he said that if imports, capital M, is equal to income Y times the marginal propensity to import, small m, and if exports must equal imports due to the balance of payments constraint, then GDP is equal to exports divided by the marginal propensity to import. Now, the dynamic version of this model is known as uh, Thurlwall's Law after the distinguished um, economist, Professor Tony Thurlwall of Kent University. And that is that long the long run growth of an economy um, is equal to, well, is approximated by the ratio of the growth of exports to the income elasticity of, of demand for imports. Where the model needs to be developed is to take account of four factors. First is inflation, which I'll come back to shortly. The second is an adjustable real exchange rate. Now, for this to work, of course, the Marshall Lerner condition needs to be satisfied. And this condition states that um, for a currency devaluation to have an impact on the trade balance, uh, the sum of the price elasticities of demand for imports and exports must, in absolute value, uh, be greater than one. You're essentially saying that we're not dealing with given goods, um, or inferior goods for that matter. Um, and this is generally the case for small countries, and of course most countries are now small in economic terms. 
Um, and this applies at least in the long run, um, provided that the inflationary pressure due to the devaluation uh, can be kept under control. Uh, the third development is uh, to take account of changes in the underlying competitive conditions uh, affecting imports and exports. And the final development is uh, to allow for changes in the terms of trade. Now, the inflation model needs to be developed uh, from the traditional Phillips curve uh, to reflect the modern reality that um, inflation is increasingly heavily dependent on the prices of imported goods, um, including primarily products, especially including uh, primary products, as well as the price of labour in the, dom the domestic market. So the simple expectations augmented Phillips curve that Doug outlined previously uh, needs to have imported inflation added in. So the new model involves therefore a number of functional relationships uh, that form the equations of the theoretical model. These are a target for expected inflation, um, inflation as a function of expectations of bo and both imported inflation and the domestic market, uh, particularly inflation from the labour market. Imported inflation that is a function of the real exchange rate and an exogen exogenously given trend in import prices. Um, imported inflation that is a function of the real exchange rate oh, covered that point already, apologies. Um, a balance of payments that has to uh, balance in the long run on some definition. A propensity to import in volume terms based on competitiveness, which in turn is affected by the exchange rate, as well as the competitiveness of other economies. Import values that equal uh, volume times price, a propensity to export based on competitiveness, which again in turn is affected by the exchange rate and the competitiveness of other economies. Export volumes that are a function of world trade and hence of world GDP and the propensity to export. And import volumes that are a function of domestic demand and implicit, implicitly domestic GDP and the propensity to import. Now this is essentially a, a simple version of CBOR's macro forecasting model, but indeed it could represent um, uh, most short-term forecasting models of the economy, which are essentially demand constrained. What is different is that we think that uh, this same approach is relevant for the medium term whereas the traditional approach sees the medium term as supply constraints. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Now, I promise you the rest of it gets easier. <laughs> the first question to ask is whether the bad forecasting from the traditional approach matters. Because maybe they've got their forecast wrong, but so what? And actually, I'm not sure that the Bank of England's forecasting errors have mattered very much. This may partly reflect the fact that Mervyn King's personal view on how the economy works is, I suspect, rather closer to our view than that of his own economists. Um, and as a result, by and large, he's got, he's got it right about growth, though less so about inflation, but then we haven't been particularly good on inflation forecasting either. And I would argue that since 2009, the Bank of England has made relatively few macroeconomic policy mistakes, despite the errors in their official forecasts. Though I do think that Alistair Darling was right in his memoirs to point out that the bank was very slow to understand the scale of the financial crisis in 2007, 2008. By contrast, I think that the errors made by the Treasury and the OBR have had an impact. Because the OBR was so slow to pick up the fact that growth was flatlining, it failed to persuade the ministers in the newly elected coalition government 
that the UK had a growth problem early enough. And this meant that the first two years of the government, which tend to be the years when it's easiest to implement measures that are good for the economy but are electorally unpopular, and by the way, most things that are good for the economy are electorally unpopular, I'm afraid, the first two years were in effect lost. And my feeling is that the OBR's role was probably more important than might usually be the case for economic forecasters uh, because of the unusual fact of the coalition, which tended to put more emphasis on the advice from the professional advisors. Looking at policy, if growth is demand constrained and particularly constrained by inflation and the balance of payments, then it is likely that policies that improve the outcome for either of these are likely to have a highly geared impact on economic growth. So increases in indirect taxes, for example, if they raise inflationary expectations, are likely to have a, damaging, a particularly damaging effect on economic growth. I don't agree with Ed Balls about much, but I suspect he's right that the VAT rise in t at the beginning of 2011 was one of the factors that made growth slow down again and eventually led us into the double dip. And the intended rise in fuel duties also does not look to be beneficial to the economy. It's not just motorists, I think, are going to suffer. Keynes's general theory was designed for a world with unemployment in major economies on a huge scale. The, uh, the Lebergott series for unemployment in the US, which is probably the best one, although there is some academic debate about this, shows the unemployment rate in the United States in the 1930s averaging about 20% and dipping below 15% for only one year, 1937. And it's worth also remembering that in the Great Depression about which Keynes was writing, we were not talking about inflation, we were talking about a period when prices were falling. In the United States, for example, the consumer price index fell by 27% between September 1929 and March 1933. The general theory is also designed for a world where capital markets were not global in the way that they are today. So these differences mean that there are some limits to the extent to which one can apply his preferred route of fiscal expansion to a small economy where inflation is positive. On an international scale, I'm relaxed about more expansionary fiscal uh, policies, uh, fiscal and monetary policies in present circumstances, when demand is being depressed by uh, consumer and corporate caution, and by deficit-cutting measures in many parts of the world at the same time. And in that sense, I am very much a Keynesian internationally. In the Western world, the liquidity trap, which was Keynes's key invention, certainly does apply since interest rates are close to zero and cannot, of course, go negative. You won't pay, one, pay someone money to give you less back in future um, if they actually tell you they're going to give you less back in future. <laughs> and, of course, asset price inflation is in many cases negative as well. For the UK, which is now a small economy, about 3% of world GDP, one would have to be more cautious because there is a risk of frightening the financial markets which could lead to a weakening of the pound that would put the inflation objective at risk. I believe there's more scope to expand the economy fiscally while keeping the financial markets happy if it is clear that public spending is being reduced persistently. Now, the final policy issue I want to deal with relates to this. Because interest rates are low, the main monetary policy instrument at present is quantitative easing in the form of the Bank of England buying gilt edge stock. The government now owns about a third of the gilts in existence. Last week, in a carefully managed exchange of letters, the bank announced that it would be handing the interest paid on these gilts back to the Treasury. Now, I see this as an essentially an accounting transaction that does not, on most definitions, affect public net borrowing. But what it does do is it opens the door to the bank simply cancelling the debt that it holds. Should they do this? The first point is 
to make is that under our theoretical framework, it makes no economic difference to optimal policy. Our framework does not work off arb arbitrary debt GDP ratio targets, and therefore the accounts, as it were, don't have to be fiddled. In the exchange of letters between the governor and the chancellor, the underlying expectation is that at some point, there will need to be some kind of quantitative uneasing as the debt purchased is sold back. Frankly, I think that if they expect to do this in circumstances where banks and potential borrowers remain as depressed as they're likely to be for the foreseeable future, and where targets for bank reserves are being progressively raised, making it more difficult for banks to lend, then they're living in cloud cuckoo land. There might be repayment at some very distant point in the future, but I'm pretty certain we won't have it in the next 10 years. So the, so the issue is essentially one of psychology. And here it's not one of economics, but judgment. My judgment is that on balance, it's better to keep the debt on the books. I don't like dodgy accounting as a way of changing policy. If the government wants to borrow more, let it make the case for doing so directly rather than using an accounting wheeze. So let me again just very quickly summarize the potential implications for policy. Anything that improves world trade competitiveness has a highly geared benefit. Anything that reduces inflation tends to have a highly geared benefit because it permits a more competitive currency level within the same inflation target. The bands around the inflation target probably can be widened, especially to take account of primary product-driven inflation. Policies that raise inflationary expectations, such as higher fuel duties or VAT, tend to be more damaging to the economy than the gain they produce from reducing the deficit, if they do that at all. Policies that damage competitiveness, like the 50p tax rate, are actually much more damaging than conventional economic analysis would suggest. But probably uh, going the other way, fiscal policy does not have to be tight in purely quantitative public borrowing terms, as it was planned to be in the 2010 budget. So the government, for example, the fiscal situation has deteriorated quite dramatically this year. The government does not have to recruit that, uh, uh, to recoup that by either cutting spending or raising taxes. The financial markets would be much more willing to accept a less rapid budget reduction if they were convinced that there was a long-term plan to bring public spending under control. Worldwide, there is a case for more expansion of fiscal policy by a coalition of the willing. And dodgy accounting to write off government debt from the Bank of England's balance sheet has no economic benefit. I'll drive much deeper into the implication for policy in my next lecture, which will be at the Museum of London at 6.30 p.m on Thursday, the 24th of January, 2013. But I do think it's important that the Treasury, OBR, and Bank of England understand this new approach to growth theory and incorporate it into their thinking, not just to improve their forecasting, but also to help improve policy formulation. Otherwise, we run the sort of risk that we had in Keynes's time of bad theory driving bad policy. But let let me be clear, even if we take account of the scope for improved policy, I think it'd be foolish for us to believe that we can ever get back to the sort of world where we can get, have rapid rates of growth and rising living standards in the way that we used to be able to have at a time when there was less competition over the shares of the world's economic cape. One of the consequences of the changed world is that we have to readjust our expectations. Now, you've all been very patient. Relatively few of you have gone to sleep. I much appreciate that. We started this lecture by thanking the accountants for letting us use this hall. We went on to show how a different approach to understanding economic growth could help both with forecasting with policy analysis and that using this approach might allow a slightly better economic outlook. We ended by condemning dodgy accounting as a way of fiddling the public finance figures. And that's quite an appropriate ending for a lecture given in this hall. So thank you very much indeed for coming and for listening. We're all prepared now to take questions. Thank you very much indeed.
For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.